FOMO. Like anything, you can use influence for good or ill. It's like a, it's like a, it's like dynamite. It, you can use it to help build a bridge. You can use it to blow up a bridge. You can use, but that's true of almost any piece of information. There are always clever individuals who can corrupt that piece of information and use it for uh, their own manipulative purposes. So we can't allow ourselves to stop making contributions of information in the world. We'd be frozen into doing nothing. That's Dr. Robert Cialdini, author of Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion. I'm your host, Patrick McGinnis, and this is FOMO Sapiens. When the world's spinning out of control, it can be impossible to know what to do and what to miss out on. That's called FOMO, which is short for fear of missing out. How do I know? Because I coined the term, and I'm the world's first FOMologist. And this is the show where I ask entrepreneurial thinkers, people I call FOMO sapiens, how they live and work with conviction no matter what life throws at them. FOMO. FOMO. Welcome back to FOMO Sapiens and a very special FOMO. show because I have today one of the great thinkers of our time, Dr. Robert Cialdini, who wrote the book Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion, and is known as the godfather of influence, which is really interesting if you want to talk about decision-making, which is, of course, what we talk about on this show, because knowing how to use influence, getting people to decide to say yes to you, and knowing when people are using the tricks of influence against you, well, all of that is critical. Dr. Robert Cialdini is known as the foundational expert in the science of influence. His principles of persuasion have become a cornerstone for any organization serious about effectively increasing their influence. He's a New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and USA Today best-selling author with over 5 million copies sold in 44 different languages. That is astounding. And he's the president and CEO of Influence at Work. Dr. Cialdini received his PhD from the University of North Carolina and postdoctoral training from Columbia University. And in acknowledgement of his outstanding research achievements and contributions in behavioral science, he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2018 and to the National Academy of Sciences in 2019. So this is a man who really needs no introduction, although I've just given you one. And what I wanted to do today was something a little different because so many people have read this book. It's kind of funny. As I told some folks that he was coming on the show, two of the people I told were reading the book at this very moment. So, I mean, this is somebody who just, he's in everybody's head right now. So as a result, rather than me asking questions, I wanted to go to the FOMO Sapiens community. So I posted on Instagram and LinkedIn asking you to submit questions. And you did. We have questions from all over the place. We have questions from Italy and Spain and Canada, the U.S., and Singapore, from listeners to the show. And they're really good questions. In fact, Dr. Cialdini told me after the interview that he loved your questions. So I want to thank those of you who submitted. And I also want to make a small ask, as I usually do. And this week's small ask is that in the future, I want to do more of that. So please follow me on Instagram or connect with me on LinkedIn so that you can make sure to see when I'm asking for listener questions, because it was such fun hearing from you. And by the way, your questions were excellent that I want to do that more often in the future. All right, we're done with the small ask and we're ready to move on to the interview. Now, as I mentioned before, Dr. Cialdini has sold a lot of books, 5 million copies of Influence. That's enough for every man, woman, and child in Ireland. So I wanted to start our interview. So I wanted to start our interview by asking him a very basic question. Why has this book sold so many copies? You know, it, first of all, it, it uh, surprised the heck out of me. I, I had no idea. Uh, that I would sell that many copies. Uh, but I think it has to do with the fact that uh, I'm a fortunate man in being interested in the psychology of persuasion, as is every other person on the planet, either from the standpoint of moving others in our direction by being persuasive or defending or uh, re rejecting uh, the persuasive appeals of people who are using tactics on us in unwelcome uh, and uh, un undue ways. 
Yeah, when I read your book uh, again, uh, I was you know you have this new version coming out, and what really struck me is you are now, and we'll talk about this a bit later. You're really updating it for a time, a very different time. You, the first version of the book came out in 1984. We are in a different world now, and one of the things that I read as I was researching you was an article somebody just wrote. They interviewed for talking about vaccines and influence. And and in fact, in this article, they talk about the fact that there's all these line cutters and that people are feeling FOMO, which made my ears perk up a little bit. And so I wanted to just be, as you are an expert on this topic, obviously, and, you know, looking at this very present challenge of getting people to want to be vaccinated, how, you know, using the lens of your work, do you look at this challenge? Well, I do uh, look at it as something that, that I have a personal responsibility to contribute to because my research has involved the question of how you move people in positive directions for all concerned and getting people into the, the mix of uh, getting us to herd immunity and uh, being immunized strikes me as one of the things that we can do. And so I've been thinking about how you go about that, and indeed, um, the the principle of social proof, the fact that there's a lot of people who want this is, is one of the things that's uh, um, animating the desire for it. But also, there's scarcity, just as you suggest with FOMO. Uh, nobody wants to miss out, and if somebody tries to cut in line, that supercharges the desire to... Um, get there before such a person who has taken your place in line. And so those uh, line cutters are actually, <laughs> in a sort of perverse way, working to enhance the experience of everybody else in terms of the uh, likelihood that they will, in fact, get immunized. I absolutely agree. And I think it's interesting here in New York City, where I live, a lot of people are getting vaccinated. It's become a conversation that you have all the time. And in fact, people are at the point, it's difficult. You have to navigate a bunch of sort of uh, different websites that have different appointments and it's almost like a game. And I have certain friends that are my type A friends who actually so love it that, <laughs> that they will, they'll be in an Uber and they'll ask the driver if they have gotten their vaccination yet, which they're very much allowed to get them, by the way. And if the person hasn't figured it out, they one of my friends got on her computer and and booked him an appointment right there, so it's amazing, right? And so it's bringing out that's that's it's amazing. It just it just shows you the power of this FOMO, and you know you might have it for other people. Now, um, Bob, w one of the things that we we're going to do today. So I, you know, because your book is so widespread, and in fact, it's funny, a good friend of mine, um, I the, I said you were going to come on the show, and he was reading the book literally the same day. I mean, he had just picked it up for the first time and was kind of excited. So he said, I want to, I want to give you a question for Dr. Cialdini. And I said, you know, that's a good start. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to put out a clarion call to the listeners of FOMO Sapiens all over the world, because one of the great things about the show is we are global and we're going to get questions from people all over the place. So what we're going to do now is go to the mailbag and give you some questions. So the first question comes from Singapore. It's from Chai Chu Su. And he says, and this is very relevant considering that you are reissuing a, an updated version of the book that brings us you know, right into 2021. So his question is, many techniques highlighted in the book, uh, which is written almost 40 years ago, still hold true today. The principles of reciprocation, scarcity, consistency, social proof, liking, and authority. In your opinion, Dr. Cialdini, what has changed, if anything? What I think has changed mostly is the platforms on which these principles can operate. When I wrote the book, there was no such thing as the internet. There was no digital marketing. There were no social media platforms and so on. Somebody uh, recently said that the book Influence is the Bible of e-commerce. There wasn't e-commerce. <laughs> so, uh, what's changed is not the principles of behavior that people are driven to uh, align themselves with. What's changed is the, the opportunities they have and the, the technologies available for doing so. Um, and um, I think that's uh, uh, one of the reasons the book has been as, has, has been as 
popular as it is, it applies to all kinds of situations and settings, even those that didn't exist when it first came out, because it's about the human condition. And the human condition doesn't change in 40 years. <laughs> we don't evolve out of who we were. We're still that uh, same uh, set of uh, individuals in, a, in the same species. So uh, I think that's the, the reason that it's happened. But I would say that if there is one thing that's ch most changed about the platforms, it's that the principle of social proof is now has now become more prominent and more accessible to people. It's possible to get a, a sense of what those around us are thinking and doing, including those who we can access on email or in chat rooms or in user groups from Singapore, for example, and, and have access to the uh, responses of other people that help us determine what our responses should be in any particular uh, setting. Yeah, and the, the point on social proof is so powerful. I think back, so I, I, my book about FOMO came out last year, and one example I gave is social proof isn't new, obviously. I mean, you were writing about it you know, in the eighties and you go back to like, I think about these like TV shows in the forties and the fifties where you had these beautiful celebrities smoking cigarettes and being like, Oh, smoking just, you know, makes me even better looking. And we all know now, of course, that was totally terrible. Right. But you think about today where you have in social media in particular, you have celebrities that are hawking goods, they're getting paid and you may not realize it. And they're, and they're sort of promoting things, but it's much more immediate because it's on your social media feed mixed in with grandma and your cousin and your next door neighbor. And so it feels very, uh, very real and organic within the flow of your life. And so it does have tremendous power. Now, I'm curious, uh, as you think about this, you know, I, I was, one example you used in your book was reviews. Um, the fact that how to spot, that you talk about how to spot fake reviews, right? And in the e-commerce space, like when you're going, these, these, like you go on a, a hotel site, and the amount of little nudges that they give you, last five rooms, 50% off only today, there's all, I mean, it's actually, to me, it's just too much. It's like overwhelming, but there's all these scarcity value things that come up. And I'm curious, because of the digital form and, and you know, the point you make about e-commerce, so many people are using their your playbook for e-commerce. Do you think we're more susceptible today than we ever were before, just because it's so much easier to cram our brains with all of these nudges? Well, I, I don't think we're more susceptible. I think we're uh, more it we're more able to access those cues and mm -hmm. that information. Uh, but we're still res responsive to those particular tendencies and triggers of those tendencies um, because we remain human. Uh, it's, it's interesting. I think you'll love this. Uh, the uh, research, uh, there was a study done of 6,200 uh, online e-commerce sites and where they did A-B tests to see which features of the site uh, most turned into conversions of uh, visitors into purchasers, let's say. And the one at the top was scarcity. Mm. The next one was social proof. The next one was a different form of scarcity. The one at the top was um, limited number, then social proof, then came limited time, then came uh, reciprocation, then came... Uh, commitment and consistency, then came liking. The, all the technological changes that were made in there, uh, you know, made almost no difference. It was the six principles of influence. So the the, the thing is, the, those principles still rise to the surface in exactly the same way that they did when we were looking at face-to-face -face interactions, where once again, we we have found that limited number is more effective than limited time. But both of those blow away most of everything else that, that people are, are, are using to uh, get us to, to move in a particular direction. The, the point is the platforms can change, the tendencies don't. If you think about it, a book that came out in 1984, 
in a vastly different world. I mean, I remember 1984. I remember, I remember well. I was, you know, I was a kid, and and um, if it was a different time, and we, it was just very simple and analog. And for these concepts to be so robust that they still work today, and that you're able to update them in a new book, is really it's quite stunning, and and it's a real achievement. Now, uh, and what's funny is, you know, I have a friend who who read the 1984 version, who is a he's a CEO of an e-commerce company. I have a friend who, who read the 1984 version. I'll be sending him the new one. And he is the CEO of an e-commerce company. And what he did was he literally took and he made a grid of the things you talked about in, in, in one column. And in the next column were ideas for marketing online. So he was able to directly, directly apply those. So anybody who's an entrepreneur who's selling things online or offline, you know, I think it's worth thinking about how you can integrate these ideas into what you do. Now, I want to go to our next question. We're going north to the wonderful country of Canada and the beautiful city of Toronto. We have a question from Saima Khan, and she says, when is influence positive and when is it negative and how can you judge the difference? I think this is a crucial question. It's one that's beset me since the beginning of writing about this, because like anything, you can use influence for good or ill. It's like a, it's like a, it's like dynamite. It, you can use it to help build a bridge. You can use it to blow up a bridge. You can use, but that's true of almost any piece of information. There are always clever individuals who can corrupt that piece of information and use it for uh, their own manipulative purposes. So we can't allow ourselves to stop making contributions of information in the world. We'd be frozen into doing nothing. But here's what I think we can do. We can rely on a, a, a system for deciding whether use of a principle of influence is ethical or not, is manipulative or not. And that is, are we able to point to it in a situation that it, where it naturally exists? If that's the case, if there's true scarcity in the situation, right? If there's, if there's true limited access to something valuable or it's dwindling in availability, uh, uh, time is ticking down, we would be fools not to let people know that so that they would be properly informed about this process, about the, the, the situation as it exists. If we fabricate the scarcity, if we fabricate social proof, if we, if we counterfeit the authority uh, voices in a situation and so on, that's the problem. That's where we're steered wrong. Now we're being deceived, right? So, or people are being deceived into in, in, into assent, as opposed to being informed into it. I'll give you a very quick example of my own situation with a scarcities. A few years ago, I was in a appliance store. I was looking to buy something else, and I saw a big screen TV that was on sale, and I knew it was, it was a very good product uh, from consumers reports. And a salesman came up to me and said, I see you're interested in this set. I can see why it's a great deal. But I have to tell you, it's our last one. Patrick, I immediately became agitated. Right? <laughs> and then he said, and I just got a call from a woman who said she might come down to the store this afternoon and buy it. Now, I'm supposed to be the uh, Master of influence, right? 20 minutes later, I'm wheeling out of the, sh the shop with that big screen TV in my cart. Because scarcity works. Right? Now, here's the question. Was it manipulative or was it informative? I have evidence that it was informative, that he, it really was the last one because I went back the next day to see if there was another one on the shelf where the one he had sold me had been. He had just gone to the back <laughs> room and, you know, no, it was an empty spot. Now, suppose he didn't tell me that. Suppose he just said, I see you're interested. I can see uh, it's a good set at this price. And I went home to think it over. 
And then I came back that evening to buy it. And he said, well, that's sorry. That it was our last one. And a woman had called me to tell me she was going to. I would have said, what? You didn't tell me this? Mm -hmm. You didn't give me all the information I needed to know about whether to buy this? What What's wrong with you, man? Right? So this is what I'm saying. When it's true, it's not only ethically acceptable to use these principles, tell people what the real authorities are saying, what they, how, how much social proof there is in the situation, whether there's truth, scarcity. It's ethically commendable. I love that you you went back to check, and I love that you had those feelings, and you're 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 admitting this to us. Have you ever heard of uh, the concept of the wounded healer of Carl Jung? No. So this is something that I found really helpful when I have feelings about FOMO because I'm supposed to be the master of FOMO, and yet I'm feeling all the FOMO. Carl Jung says that a lot of people who go into psychotherapy do it because they have they have had their own problems and in the in the past and realized the value of psychotherapy and so they want to go into the field but they are only a step ahead of the patient in their own journey of recovery and so sometimes those of us go into a field because we struggle with those things so we're the wounded healer we are we you know we recognize the problems and we're because we have the problems ourselves we are best positioned to help other people if you had a chance to read the first line in my book it mm -hmm. is I could admit it freely, freely now. All my life, I've been a patsy. <laughs> I saw that. Yeah, I needed to know this just out of self-defense. <laughs> I love this. So we are diagnosing you as wounded healer, which is a good thing to be. Uh, I want to now head down to sunny Palm Beach, Florida. I have a question from Brad Saft. And he says, how do you think about your research's dual applications? Number one, protecting consumers from marketing tricks, while at the same time, number two, being used by marketers to develop more effective tactics. Does it ever pose a moral quandary for you? Yes, uh, it does. And I worry about that, uh, uh, as I suggested. And mm -hmm. what I have argued in uh, the places where I write about the ethics of it is that uh, I have to first of all, give only examples of people who've used these principles properly. That's that's the whole, but you'll never find, you know, I, I, I'm going to describe people who have figured out ways to be ethical about this. Those are the techniques that I that I describe. But secondly, when I give lectures on this, I, I speak to uh, audiences uh, uh, on the topic, I, I insist that using these principles unethically is a short-term game. If you do it regularly, you're going to be caught and people will never do business with you again. If the, if you, if they see you as, as a cheater, why would they ever want to do business with you again? So those are the messages I think that are important to send, uh, both implicitly in the fact that I describe the proper way to do it. And then, explicitly in describing uh, the consequences of doing it um, improperly. Yeah, it's like the boy who cried wolf. Uh, eventually, just doesn't work out. <laughs> now let's go to, let's cross the Atlantic to another sunny place, sunny Spain in Madrid. We have a question from Bernardo Pacheco Duarte, who says... What are the key attributes of a true influencer? Not just someone with a lot of followers, but someone who actually moves things. What do these people have that others do not? Okay, so I'm going to say uh, in concert with uh, that question, it's not changing attitudes or beliefs or perceptions. It's changing behavior. It seems it's not that attitudes and beliefs and perceptions of, aren't important, but they all exist, it seems to me, in the service of getting people to change their behavior. You, you, you change mm -hmm. those things in order to get those things. So let's let's limit our idea to that. That to, what are the what are the things that people recognize that allow them one. One of them is they know these principles. They understand either intuitively or they they learned about the typical human tendencies toward assent based on the information that they've received. Okay. But there's one other thing. I recently 
wrote a book called Presuasion. And one of the things I did was to look back at all the evidence I had gained uh, about successful influencers. And I realized that the, the, those who were most successful not only knew what to put in their message, usually one or another of these principles, they also knew what to put in the moment before they sent their message. They cultivated the earth before they put their seed. Of, you know, you can have, it doesn't matter how great a seed you have. If you haven't cultivated the ground before you plant it, it's not going to yield fullest fruit, right? So what these people did was to arrange for pe- for their the recipients of their message to be aligned with their message before they experienced it. And the way they did that was to create mindsets in their audiences that were that were consistent with the message they were about to hear. I'll give you an example. Uh, do you, are, are you a, a wine drinker, Patrick? Yeah, sure. Definitely. If you were to go into a wine shop, the research shows that if the if there was a German song playing on the PA system, you'd be more likely to buy a German vintage. Hmm. If there was a French song playing, you'd be more likely to buy a French wine. Right. So what's what has occupied your consciousness before that decision will steer you in the direction of what's top of mind. Yeah, that's, and those that's, people wow. who those pre-suaders knew how to do that. Okay, let's stay in Europe. But we're going to head east to Ischia, Italy, where we get a question from Fernanda Mayo. And she says, do we still see social proof in the number of followers somebody has on social media, or is that kind of social proof losing its power? Well, it's losing its power because people are um, are counterfeiting those, those followers, right? And so now that uh, that particular technique of representing social proof is no longer as reliable as it used to be. And people are figuring out ways to get followers that don't really love the <laughs> love the message or the, the program. But, you know, there are various ways to build your following like this uh, that are essentially uh, not, tr- not truly uh, uh, powerful. So that doesn't mean social proof doesn't work. It just means that particular version of it doesn't work. But there are all kinds of others. I, I saw some, uh, some uh, uh, studies uh, showing that there's one phrase you could use uh, if you were a clerk at a McDonald's that increased the likelihood that people would buy a McFlurry de- dessert after their meal by 56%. And here's what it is. The McFlurry is our p- most popular dessert. Mm -hmm. and McFlurry purchases jump by 56%. It's still social proof, right? So you can change the ways you get there depending on the situation, and you will see the effect. But sometimes, because people will undermine the reliability of some of the ways of getting to a true picture of social proof, you might uh, start dropping, dropping away uh, your use of them. For example, uh, star ratings in, on, on review sites. Do you know there's a very interesting finding? The, there's a particular range of stars, star uh, ratings, that is most likely to produce uh, a, a, a purchase. And five stars isn't included in the range. It's from 4.2 to 4.7. If you don't, if you don't have some non-fives, people say, oh, that's a this is this is a phony site. This was a rigged right uh, evaluation. So again, social proof is still gonna work, but uh, some uh, con artists who figured out a way to game the system 
have caused us to move away from certain kinds of uh, techniques for uh, deciding what what's true social proof. All right. And we have one more final question. We're going to return to the heartland of America, Austin, Texas, from Jeremy Strike. And he just has a request from you. He asked if you would just share with all of us, because he loves this so much, how you talk about perceptual contrast in the story of Sharon, the co-ed, the, the co-ed writing home to her parents. So if you could share that story with us, I read it and I was cracking up. I think it's a great way to show uh, for anybody who hasn't read the book, the type of work that you that you're doing. Sure. So perceptual contrast is the phenomenon in which people who see th- two things that are presented in, uh, right at one after the other, if they are different from one another, right, they seem even more different than before. So um, it, 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 you should always, uh, when you present something, also say compared to something else, you, because people are always going to look at the, that that difference. So Sharon, I got this letter that came across my desk from Sharon, who was a student. Um, and let me read some of it. And so Sharon um, was writing back to her parents for the first time. And um, she says the following. Dear mother and dad, since I've left for college and have been remiss in writing, I'm sorry for my thoughtlessness in not having written before. Well, I'm getting along pretty well now that the skull fracture and the concussion I got after I jumped out of the window of my dormitory uh, after it caught fire shortly after my arrival is pretty well healed now. I only spent two weeks in the hospital and can and only get those sick headaches twice a day. Fortunately, the fire in the dorm and my jump was witnessed by an attendant at the gas station near the dorm He also visited me in the hospital, and because I had nowhere to live, because of the burnt-out dormitory, was kind enough to allow me to share his apartment with him. It's just a basement (laughs) room, but it's kind of cute. He's a very fine boy. We've fallen deeply in love and are planning to be married. We haven't got the exact date yet, but it will be before my pregnancy begins to show. Okay, so then, (laughs) then at the end, she says, now that I brought you up to date, I want to tell you there was no dormitory fire. I did not have a concussion or a skull fracture. I'm not, I was not in the hospital. I am not pregnant. I am not engaged and there is no boyfriend. However, I'm getting a D in American history and an F in chemistry. And I want you to see those marks in their proper perspective. (laughs) So she's, it's a brilliant use of the contrast principle. Now, Sharon may be failing chemistry. She gets an A in my psychology grade book. <laughs> Sharon, time to switch majors. Oh my goodness. See, that that is amazing. And thank you so much for reading the story. I'm sure Jeremy will enjoy it. It's been really great uh, having you here. The new book is out now, Influence the Psychology of Persuasion. You can check out Dr. Cialdini's work at influenceofwork.com. Dr. Robert Cialdini, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Patrick. FOMO. Big news. We now have a brand new website. So head over to FOMOSapiens.com where you can listen to past episodes, learn more about the show, and find out how to advertise. Also, head over to Spotify where you can find and follow playlists of the best of the show. You can also connect with me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on LinkedIn. I'd love to hear from you, so don't be shy. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstro. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMOSapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com. FOMOSapiens.com